Well, Cheryl, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Wow. Well, um, we we met. What was that? Five years ago that we met, maybe. You know, it might have been, and it was like the greatest day of my life because <laughs> because it was so unexpected. I mean, I actually, you were in our church building. You were in town with uh, Orange. Yeah, with Reggie Joyner. Reggie and I. I I was already a big Carrie fan, okay? And I hadn't told any of my family about you. I was just like, I love this guy. I love his writings. And I hadn't told anybody about that. So my, you were in, in town for an orange event. You were yeah. in one of the rooms here with your team and Reggie Joyner. Uh, so y- y'all are in this room and my son-in-law, Mark, and my daughter are part of the orange team. Yeah. And they brought me into that room and said, you want to meet Reggie and, and his team? So I walked in the room thinking I'm going to meet Reggie and his team. And I looked, the first person that my eyes fell on was you. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh, it's so nice to meet you. And I'm like wanting to hug you. And my son-in-law, Mark, is like, "Mm -mm, that's not Reggie. That's not him. That's not the one. (laughs) And I'm like, that is the one. That's Carrie. I don't know who Reggie is, but Carrie, that's Carrie. He's the one I've been reading all of his blogs and he's helping me. It was so funny. I'll tell you, that was, I will never forget that moment. (laughs) I think you shrieked and jumped up and down and it was... (laughs) I mean, that does I not still- normally happen. I do not get that reaction. So Cheryl, it's just that was uh, I, I I try not to kid Reggie kid Reggie about that too much, but uh, we've been friends for a long time, so yeah. it can withstand it. You know, I think come to mention it for longtime listeners of this podcast, I've had Sam Collier on. I think that was the first time I met Sam Collier too, because he was with us on that ride to oh. the Potter's House North. Dallas yeah. that day. Oh, fascinating. Great anyway, attitude. well, yeah. oh, uh, I came in, did a little bit of work with your team, and you were sh- so gracious. And oh. uh, I'll tell you, you're in a bit of a, well, relatively unique position in that lead pastor of a large church and, um, you know, have been a female lead pastor now for a while. And uh, that was probably a little bit less common a few decades ago than it is today. Do you want to Tell us about how you got started in leadership and take us yeah, back to the beginning. Absolutely. Um, it was uh, I, it was 10 years ago that uh, I, well, I had been with uh, Bishop Jakes for, been with him for almost probably 30, 32, 33 years. T.D. Jakes, right? You T. knew T. him Jakes. before Bishop anybody T. else T. knew Bishop Jakes. Well, I don't know about that, but I did come in on the ground floor of really of his a major exposure to explosion to the world. Uh, I met him through a cassette tape uh, and it's a cassette tape. Now, let me Those were the days, that. man. We all <laughs> had cassette <laughs> ministries. It was, uh, that was, that was amazing. Absolutely. So I met him through that and I was so intrigued by it. I wanted to actually see him in person. So I worked it out to where I could go see him in person. And from that moment, that night in particular, it, changed my life. It was a little tiny, small church in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Hmm. and it was hot. There was no air conditioning. It was in the summer. They had the windows open. uh, And I watched him preach. And the more he preached, he could tell a story like nobody that I had ever seen tell a story out of the scripture. He made it come alive to me. And so just simply because of that, it started churning things inside of me and things I didn't even know were there. I, you have to, to know, I grew up very, I wasn't an only child, but I was a lonely child because mm-hmm. I was one of the late bloomers and my grown sisters were all married and moved on. And so, uh, I was kind of quiet and kind of shy Mm. And uh, people still to this day, they don't really believe that, but it, it's very, very true. I was very quiet type person. Um, and as I was watching, the more I watched Bishop Jakes, I kept feeling something wake up inside of me. Mm. Um, I didn't even know was there. I was like 32 years old before I realized that God really wanted to use me to speak to people's lives into wow. people's lives. What were you doing I at that know. time? What was your, you, you had kids, you were, yeah. yeah so had, what was I your, had, your day job, so to speak at that time? 
Um, actually, my husband traveled and, and spoke a lot. And I had three kids under the age of two. Yeah. So that was pretty much my day, my <laughs> nights, my middle of the 100%. night. 100%. Yeah. It was everything. Um, and I would travel with him periodically, but, um, I, I all of the, all that time and I, I, I loved it. I, because it was quiet and I married a man who was a big talker. Um, it just worked. He would just talk and I would just amen him. Uh, and I loved being a mom mm. and I loved making sure my kids had what they needed every day. And so, I, I mean, I loved all of that. And so i never even gave myself to, thinking that there was anything else in me. I didn't hmm. give myself to that. Uh, I, do, I loved the Lord. I, I loved my church. I loved all of that. But I always thought that I was supposed to be somebody's cheerleader. Yeah. And, and it was never supposed to be me. I didn't realize that, that, that there was anything in me that hmm. was called to speak or had the courage to even take a platform. And somebody said, well, you're a preacher. And I'm like, no, I'm not a preacher. I'm a, I'm a reacher. Okay. I don't want to be a preacher because there's too much pressure that comes with that. Um, it just, just those kind of things. I shied away from everything until, till I heard, uh, Bishop Jake's voice and started reading his books and began to know him. And we ultimately end up moving, ended up moving to West Virginia, mm -hmm. which, um, like, I don't, I don't, you know, if you look at it now, people would probably say, well, why would you just even move to West Virginia? Yeah. Um, I was from Detroit, you know. OK, originally. yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I was born in Windsor. So how do you do that's that? That's why we connected so well, right yes, across the river. Right there. Yeah. That's, um, so, so it's like, how, how do you do how do you make those kind of moves? But I I was so hungry um, and he's he spoke in a way that it woke up something in me and my wonderful husband um while he was blessed and while he was fed uh, as well, he was so firm about that thing getting woke up in me. And he was so supportive and um, just such a strong individual himself. Mm. But he, he knew that uh, if, if that could wake up in me, that it, it was unlimited what God could do for us. And so we moved there and we joined his church. We were elders in the church, sat on the front row. And when he uh, moved to Dallas uh, back in 1996, we moved with him. Wow. We came to Dallas. We just continued to serve in the church. Um, and then after a, a couple years later, my husband said, I think God is calling us back to the East Coast. He said, um, we need to build a church. And, you know, I was so busy being um, just playing those supporting roles with a Bishop Jakes or with my life in the church there um, that I, I thought it was going to be a horrible thing, you know, because I'm sitting there listening to him preach every day and uh, every Sunday. And I'm like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, does it ever get any better than this? And uh, to think that now we're going to go start our own church. Uh, I was like, OK, well, I really hope this is God. I went, but I went kind of kicking and screaming in my spirit because I didn't want to leave. And yet those 10 years, uh, when we finally did move back to, uh, to Raleigh, we built the church that is called the river. Those 10 years were incredible years. Hmm. Uh, it was where I learned so many vital leadership, uh, principles and issues. And I learned how to love and pastor people, how to get involved in their lives and yet not get so involved that I became overwhelmed and lost my own life in the middle of it. Because I know when you are um, in ministry or you're in leadership, sometimes you can do that. You can get so involved. But uh, I learned so, so much. And God opened so many great doors for me. And um, we ended up just Bishop Jake's calling us 10 years later. And he said, you know, I want to start a campus uh, in North Dallas. And he said, uh, I want to know if y'all will pray about coming home. Hmm. And that, that's exactly what we did. We prayed about coming home and we came home and here it is now. We've been here for 10 years. And he said, I want to put you out there in that campus. He said, I want you to lead it. I want you to pastor it. Um, and let's just see what God is going to do. And 10 years later, 
uh, we're here. It's had its challenges, of course, but um, I'm telling you, it's been phenomenal to, to have to have people like a Bishop Jakes and my husband being strong, um, be as pillars in my life. I think it's enabled me and empowered me to do what God has allowed us to do here at the Father's House North. Well, it's fascinating to hear the story, and I appreciate the way you told it, too, because I think you have a lot of unlikely leaders listening to this episode who maybe, to some extent, felt a little bit like you in your early 30s. It's like, this yeah. is not what I'm going to do with my life. This is, what do you mean I'm a leader? And I mean, you're somebody who's who's grown into incredible influence on your own. Uh, you know, just a huge impact around the world globally as a leader and as a preacher and as a communicator and of course, as an author as well. So, uh, you know, I think that would surprise a lot of people who met you a decade or so into the journey that like, what? You really struggled with whether you were even equipped or gifted to lead? You mentioned that you had in that first church you planted uh, before you did the Potter's House North in Dallas. Uh, you learned a lot of leadership lessons along the way. Can you walk us through a few of those, Cheryl, and just tell yes. us like, what were some wake-up calls where you're like, oh, huh. this is leadership. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, this yeah. is leadership. Good morning. You know, uh, yeah. it's in your face. Um, you know, I, one of the things, um, anybody that's in, in possibly in ministry uh, or, you know, even in corporate America, if we're not careful, um, we can build our careers, our churches, our ministries, our businesses. We can be so busy pouring into them that w not in, and not even intentionally, but we can neglect our home base. Mm -hmm. And home is so vital. And especially for people that are in ministry, I say we can neglect home because um, it's like you're helping people that are in need. So there's something in you that feels like, well, this is legitimate. This is, you know, I can, I need to do this. And so um, uh, what, what uh, it's easy to sacrifice our families on the altar of the church. Even, okay, I, I want to dissect that a little bit because yeah. men do that all the time. And I don't want to be gender stereotyped here. Sure. Um, but you found that to be a struggle even as a mom in leadership, a woman in leadership. It was, that was something you had to self-correct on? Early. I did yeah. that early in life. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I tried hard. I, I'm not, I've not been perfect at it by no means. But I, I am a, I am a, 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 an advocate for the fact that we need to sometimes we need to slow down and realize that home needs you too. Wow! And I had to. Uh, I when I came to Dallas, I came with my family, which that's a whole story in and of itself, which was such a blessing. Um, but I think because they they knew that they mattered to me. Yeah. that they could trust uh, that what God had for my life, that he had something in it for their lives as well. And I mean, I think that's the true power of team. I, I, I never came expecting that this was, oh, this was something for me. Yeah. No, I came holding, locking arms saying, guys, um, this is, this is going to have to take an entire team because I don't have everything. Um, I remember sitting down at the table uh, with, with my um, my three daughters, my three son-in-laws, my husband, and I remember, and, and a few of the people that came with us from Raleigh, and I remember sitting at the table, and we were trying to cast a vision, and I was like, let me tell you something right now, don't look at me for this whole thing, because I don't have this whole thing. I don't know how to do this. We have been called here as a team, and when I tell you that when the Bible says that iron sharpens iron, it is so very true because over the last 10 years, we've sat at the table, hashed things out. Somebody would bring a piece. Somebody would bring this. Somebody would bring that. And one thing about it, I may not have been the originator of that vision, but the minute I see it, I know that's a part of us. And we would adopt this and that. And I think we have the fruit today that says, you know, this is the way God meant for us to be. 
And I, I, I just never felt like I had all the answers or all of the vision. And um, Bishop Jakes, you know, of course, when we came, he was kind enough to say, uh, you've been with me, Cheryl, for 20 some odd years. Uh, you know me. So uh, you know what I would like, what I wouldn't like. But he was such an incredible leader through that time mm. because he never put me in a box. He never said, you have to do this. You have to do that. Um, he just really, and he gave me whatever I would ask for as far as, can we start this? Can we do that? He would always say yes. And that kind of bothered me a little bit because I was thinking, okay, why is he always saying yes? So one day I just asked him and he was like, well, because if I give you everything that you want and it doesn't work, then you'll know why. You know, you basically, if I give you everything, then then you can never say you didn't give me that. And you didn't give me this. So he gave it to me. Of course, I by the grace of God, I didn't ask for crazy stuff. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so he he really helped me in 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 the foundational part. But the team, when I tell you the importance of team, I, I mean, I can't I can't talk enough about it because even the Bible says we know in part. And mm. we prophesy in part. And I, I think where a lot of leaders miss it is, is they are not willing to admit what they don't know. And I had to admit that, Carrie. I had to say, first of all, to myself uh, and then to my kids um, who are grown men and women and they have their own worlds going on. But I had to admit them. Yeah. Yes. I, I was kind of the door. The opportunity came to me, but we need to attack this as a team because your destiny is tied up in it as well. I think that's and, a very, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so I was just going to say, so family, uh, and, and, and that didn't start just when we came to Dallas. Yeah. Um, I think, I, like I said, I think I tried not to sacrifice my family along the journey on the altar of saying, oh, no, I can't I can't do this because I have to go to the church or, you know, I can't go to this because I have to be at the church. Um, I I really tried hard and I want to encourage leaders, whether it's your business uh, or what whatever it is that you're doing in life. If you have a family, man, pour into them because your family are your are to me. They were my shock absorbers that no matter mm what I went through and through the loss. And we'll get into that in a moment of my sister, my mother. It was like my family had the ability to absorb the shock out of me. And I think it's because I made, uh, I made them a priority and I, you know, I still have to work at it now. We all do, but it's not at the end of the day, what you've got, you might have a great business, but when you can't fix your own hair and you can't brush your own teeth, hello, you're, it's those it's those kids or those family members that are around you. And I think it's important that we cherish family. I cherished family and now cher a family cherishes me. And when you spend your love on family, everybody wins. I think that's such a good insight on so many levels, Cheryl. And uh, you know I think I think you you had fingered in that a lot of leaders struggle to make it seem like we have all the answers. And one of the things I've always appreciated about you in the time that we've spent one on one is, you know, when you speak, it's powerful. I mean, it's like like you're you you it's really quite powerful. And you seem on the outside like a really powerful leader, but to admit that, hey, I was in my thirties, I didn't know like I need team. And you're right. We've had Les McEwen on this podcast multiple times, and he says the key to scale is quality team based decision making. And when you look at the size of the church that you lead and the team that you lead and the movement that you lead, uh, there has to be team-based decision-making. But I think a lot of leaders come to it like, here's here's a download. This is what we should do. Now everybody gets on board. But you kind of came about it the other way around going, I don't know which way to the promised land. I need your help, yes. right? Which I love. So do, how did you discover that? How did uh, can you Can you drill down a little bit more on that? Because I think that's a very important insight. Um, I, I think that it was, and it is even to this day, I think that I, it, it, I, it's easy for me to admit, I don't have the answers. Mm. I can't fix everything. Um, and I, I, I need help. And because 
we've walked so close as a family. Now, this leads into to something else because you all, you know, a lot of times people that have churches, you you wrestle with the fear of people thinking, oh, this is a family church sure. and there's there's nowhere for me to grow or there's nowhere for me to fit because this is a family church. And I heard that a, a lot of my life. And and so I, I thought about that a few times. But then I thought, well, just because my children are biologically related to me, uh, if they can play the role, does that disqualify them from the part? Mm-hmm. And now I'm quick to say, if if you can't play the role, then you you can't do the job. But I'm not going to disqualify you. And to me, there's something about family. God wanted a family. That's why the body of Christ exists. And so um, I think there there's a, in a lot of places there's a fine line where it can be uh, you know not maybe not so healthy. But I think that. My kids, they knew me. They they know my thought processes. I know theirs. And a lot of times they'll finish my sentences. Hmm. And I'm like, why don't we why don't we just take this and let's let's work in the church with this? And um now is that always easy? It's not, because especially when family is important to you, it it's hard to be family and to work with family and to have all of your kids sitting around a table. Um, and some of them are biological and now our, our circle is broadened and we brought in other people that have really been sons and daughters, Mm -hmm. uh, for years. But the Bible says, know them that labor among you. And that's, that's the kind of people that I have around my table. And, uh, I respect them. They respect Mm -hmm. me. I respect their thoughts. They respect mine. And we're 10 years in here and, I can say so far, so good. Well, yeah. So and far, so good. <laughs> wisdom is proved right by all of our children, right? So I think <laughs> I think that's very true. Uh, what have been some of the, we, we were talking about one before we hit record, but what have been some of the challenges and hurdles you've had to clear in leadership? I know there's always a lot for everybody. Sure. I, and and I, will, I will always point back to just um, not allowing the demand of ministry to cause you to forget your own mm. because sometimes we just think that, okay, you, you get over it. I'll be back to you in a minute. And I, but right now I got to go heal this person. I got to touch. I got to pray. I got to counsel. I got to do whatever. Um, and I found out that ultimately the strength of my ministry has come out of the strength of my family. Mm. And when my fam, when my house is right, I don't just go in my own strength or leftover strength. Um, but I, I understand the power of agreement and the force that comes from just knowing that my home base is behind me and we're together. Um, so th- that, you know, not just giving your family away and trying to help everybody else's family or your marriage away and trying yeah. to help everybody else's yeah. marriage. That's that's what you see a lot of that today. Um, so that's been that's been challenging and not the decision to do it, but the decision to not allow yourself to become distracted from that because you understand how important that is. Um, working with family mm-hmm. can be challenging because uh, you want to be uh, you want to be family outside of here. But in here, you got to lay all of these things down and you got to be like, OK, bring your best ideas to the table uh, and then you got people at your table who will disagree with one another. And, and as I'm like, the, uh, my mother hat is on. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, my goodness, my daughters are, are arguing with my my son-in-laws. My son-in-laws are arguing with each other. You know, yeah, how do you navigate happens. that? And, like, do you have any rules? Let or me tell you, if yeah. I knew how to do that, Carrie, I would put it in a bottle and sell it and I would be <laughs> rich. I don't even know how to do that, except like to sit there and pray and say, God, give us wisdom. Give us understanding, because at the end of the day, we all want the best. Yeah. We want what is the best. We want God's perfect will. And um, so many times we just had to hash our way through it. Um, ultimately, it's made us stronger. And then, you know, just personally, um, I lost my sister uh, in October of 2017. She had been in about a seven-year battle with cancer. Mm. And my sister and I were very, very close. Um, and I, I lost her. And I, that was the thing that I was, 
I just knew God was going to touch her. I knew she was in a fight and I was, I wanted her to, to make it and I just knew he would. Okay. And then, um, and then I lost her. Hmm. And when I tell you that, that started challenging the core of everything I believed, you know, it's bad enough to lose somebody you love, hmm. but then to have to be challenged on the very thing that you thought God would do and he didn't do. Yeah. Um, that was, that was a real personal challenge for me. I even got to the point where I said uh, to God, I, I, I had to, we were having a, a, a night of hope at our church and mm-hmm. it was shortly after my sister passed and I was supposed to come out there. They had, the music had been great. The, all of the arts, it just was a beautiful night. And I was supposed to come out with the grand finale and wrap it up and talk about hope. And I was standing on the side of the stage and I was holding a microphone in my hand, waiting for my cue to walk out and just wrap this up and put a nice mm. bow on it like a pastor's supposed to. And I felt like fainting. I felt like running out the back door um, because I... I felt like I I didn't I didn't know what was going to come out. Mm. You know, as a speaker, you pretty much kind of have your your thing your 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 talk mapped out yeah. or your yeah. message mapped out. You you kind of know where you're going. That night, I was afraid that that I wasn't going to have a filter. What were and, you feeling inside when you're oh, standing yeah. leading up to that? Fake, hmm. um, like a phony. Like, I know what they expect me to say. I know what I should say. But what I could potentially say is absolute opposite of that. Because I wanted to come out and say, where's God when you need him? You know, I know I've told y'all he's a healer, but I'm not sure that I can tell y'all that anymore. Now, that's raw and that's rare, uh, maybe for some people, maybe nobody ever goes through that kind of a thing. Oh, uh, I think you'd I, be surprised. Yeah. yeah, I know I did. And uh, I, I even got to the point where I told God, I don't even know if I can tell them what I've always told them about you. I don't know that you are everything I always said that you were. And but this is what I knew through all no matter how much I doubted. And no matter how hurt I was and no matter the loss, I knew I loved God. Hmm. And I knew that he was everything to me. And I knew that he had blessed my life. And and yet I didn't even know that night if my love was strong enough to withstand this particular storm. So I walked out when they said it was my time. I'm thinking to myself, I got to walk out here now, put a bow on this and make them feel um, hopeful when I feel hopeless. Hmm. And I walked out there and I just started talking and I just got real, real. And I just put it out there, told them how I felt. And I I remember just quoting the scripture. When I I tell you that there's power in the word of God, Mm. uh, for me as a leader, there was so much power because I remember opening my mouth and some of this is on video. You could see a clip of it, but I remember opening my mouth and saying, I was saying, I don't know if God's this. I don't know if he's that. I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't know, but what I do know is I will let nothing separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus Mm-hmm. Nay, you know, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. The, I said that. And when I said it, it was like all of a sudden, OK, God, I don't miss. I, I, I still don't know why you why this happened. But I know one thing. I'm not going to allow it to separate me from you and mm-hmm. the love that you have for me. And that night, just being honest is because I think if you don't, if you don't own where you are, you can't fix where you are. Yeah. Yeah. And as a leader, I, I'm looking at a wonderful church, wonderful staff, wonder, I, I was so busy looking at what I lost that I didn't realize what I had been left with. Hmm. And I had been left with a wealth of people and relationships and opportunities. And 
I had to, everything shifted for me that night. And even at that point, people started calling and telling me, man, you don't know what that did for me to hear you say that you struggled with this. And it's, it's just was one of those moments in my life where I was just honest and God intervened. I really appreciate you sharing that. And you come from a tradition, as do some of our listeners, which tends to emphasize the positive side of yes. the God. Like you're a very positive person, positive preaching, God can do anything. And now yes. you're there with your own crisis. You must have been like nervous that night to be feeling those emotions and to share that with your church. Yes, because I never have been a good at at faking anything, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always say when you're in love, you can't hide it. And when you're not, you can't fake it. Mm. Uh, so I've never been really good at that. And so I was walking out on that stage, just my whole world. It was like everything was shaking because I knew my face was going to tell it all, no matter what my voice was saying. Mm -hmm. And so that was a moment, you know, I had to really, I just, but I had to be, I had no other choice. I had to be open and honest and I'm, I, what is amazing is is the hope that filled the room yeah. uh, in that night of hope, just through us being honest, through us, through me saying, I don't have the answer. And I think that, I think if people could just, you know, I think ego plays into a lot of the front that we put up today, you know? It sure does. Um, because we put up this, this, I don't know this front that we got it going on, that we're all together and that um, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And, and yet sometimes I don't, I didn't, I don't always feel that God was good, especially in that moment, you know? Um, but we put up this persona and then our, it's our ego's job to protect the image that we have built, you know? And so there's, there's so much that goes on. You're wrestling with your ego, you're wrestling with your image, uh, and then in the middle of it, in all of it, you lose your integrity. So mm. we we have a great image, but we have no integrity because we're not really being honest. And I, I, I realized that night that the absence of my faith uh, in that moment um, did not equate to the absence of God. Mm. He was still there, you know, and uh, and he helped me through that moment. It was seven, I, just when I, I, th I say you never get over uh, grief, but you can, there is a path that you can get through it. Mm. And as I began to work my way through that, it was seven months, seven days later that uh, I lost my mother. Yeah. So, so, and sorry. both of them were pillars. So we, here we are back on this same thing again, but it was not to the severity that this first loss was. Let me mm. tell you something. I am a pastor. I've walked people through grief. Mm -hmm. I've prayed for them. I've buried their loved ones. I've done all of that. But it was not until I went through grief myself that I realized now um, what people really need. They don't just need our words. Mm. They need our heart. Sometimes they just need our ear. Mm. And they need our honesty. And through that, it was a personal challenge, but we developed a grief and loss support group um, that is revolutionizing people in our church's lives. People are hurting. Yeah. They're just hurting. And what, so. What do you think that night of hope where you kind of just opened up your heart and said, look, this is where I'm at. I know this is not where pastors are supposed to be, but this is where I'm at. What impact do you think that had on your church in terms of their permission to be honest and truthful about where they were at? Yes, it, 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 it had a huge impact. I remember them breaking out in an applause hmm. and they were clapping because all of a sudden, you know, as pastors, you try your best to connect with your audience in your congregation. Hmm. You, we use all kinds of stuff. We use stories. We use all, we use everything to try to just make a, a heart connection, and and I had done that for years, and little would I have ever thought that my raw, honest, I'm struggling with God issues too, uh, would cause them to open up like they hmm. opened up, hmm. and I think 
that just seeing me survive now has given them the hope that, listen, if Pastor Brady can get through this, I can get through this too. And we've been blessed to to see a lot of people find hope again. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's a fine line. I've I've seen church leaders, leaders, and even frankly in the corporate world, I've seen CEOs who have lost the vision, lost heart. It's like yeah. they're not really in it anymore. They're leading the company, but in name only. Pastors who have deconverted or had crises of faith. That's not what you're talking about. It's not like no, you, no. you still very much believe in the mission of the Potter's House. So I just want to clarify that. And yet, you know, you had a very real uh, moment of transparency. Yes. Uh, and, and I think there's a really significant difference between the two. Has, has that kind of moment, uh, which seemed like, uh, you know, a unusual thing for you, has, has that changed the way you've communicated or connected with your church since or the way you teach or preach since that moment? I believe it has because yeah. um, it, you know, it's, it's pain is not prejudice, okay? Hmm. It hits all of us. Right. Pain is not prejudice. What, whatever, whoever you are, there'll be moments of pain. Um, but we, like I said a moment ago, we have a tendency to build um, – to maybe cover ours when we're on a platform, when we're in a, when we have a title, when we have a position. Um, but you know what? Jesus came and he went through everything that you and I would ever go through so that when we bring it to him and say, God, my heart is broken. He's like, yeah, I know exactly what that feels like. Mm -hmm. He, and so he's moved by the feelings of our infirmities so if Jesus had to come and go through what I, what Cheryl Brady or what Carrie would have to go through, if he had to go through that so that he could identify with our feelings, then who are we as leaders, as CEOs, or uh, whoever we are, who are uh, business owners, who are we to think that we don't have to connect with people? Mm -hmm. that, that's gold, okay? That's your superpower, mm -hmm. as some might say, is to be able to connect with people because when people, uh, when they realize that you're not some, some drastic difference between you and them, all of a sudden it, it causes there to be a connection. Yeah, and it bridges they, the gap, right? Yes, and they buy into you and, and you buy into them and it's joint supplying joint. It's, it's all of us connecting. And it's, it's a, every president that, that has been, um, touchable or had that persona of like, yeah, I bet he, I bet he is an ordinary man. You mm. know, it makes people, makes people love that. And, and the real reason is because it's real. It's honest. We're human. You know, I don't care if you are a leader. I don't care if you are the CEO of your company. We're still human. And sometimes we can, we can find ourselves backing into this bubble. Leaders do it every day. We back into a bubble. Sometimes we back up because we don't know the answer. Uh, sometimes we back up because we just don't want to be vulnerable. Uh, for, but whatever causes you to back up, like, like the prophet uh, Elijah backed up into a cave, whatever your cave is, um, it, I'm grateful that, that we serve a God who will reach into our cave and find us and pull us out. Uh, he, he climbed up under a juniper tree and said, I just don't want to live anymore. First of all, okay, I want to say to him, it's not that serious, all right? It's just <laughs> this one woman named Jezebel. Uh, but the truth of the matter is if you, you can put that into our lives, and people do it all, all the time. They back up. And I think it's important that in those moments that we have connections and friendships and we're able to dialogue with one another and, and not take ourselves so seriously. I've seen that so many years. What are some of the best decisions you've made in leadership? Mm. Um, I will say right off the bat, uh, is one of the best decisions I have personally made was to have a growth mindset. Mm. Um, I come from a line of preachers, and my, my father was a preacher, my grandfather was a preacher, um, so I come from, I've been in the church all of my life. 
I was born on Easter Sunday, so I was, you know, I'm always saying, yes, I've got resurrection power in me. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have also seen generations that have gone by that, and some that are yet here today, uh, still alive and among us, that refuse to have a growth mindset. Yeah. It's everything is the same way that it's always been. And I learned early to be open, to stick my head in some different worlds, um, to listen to different, different writers. Um, like, I, like there's no way in the world I should have found you. Hmm. Um, and, and yet I, when I saw something, you have a beautiful way of, of just categorizing things that grabs people's attention and it grabbed mine and I leaned in and I, I, the more I read, the more I wanted to lean in. And then the more I read and wanted to lean in, the more I wanted to tell everybody, um, because it helped me. And I think I just having that growth mindset because, you know, I may not have all the answers when it comes to what's, what's next, but I am open to hearing who does and to hearing what they will be because I think I'm very grateful for what I've learned and how I've gotten to the point that I am. But I'm also realized that sometimes uh, where I was cannot take me where I want to go. And so I'm in between. And I think at that point, the scripture to say it scripturally, the Bible says that a wise man takes out of his both out of his treasure, both old and new. And I think mm-hmm. when you can merge the old and the new, then there's that creates that carves a path for you to go forward. I think that uh, growth mindset is a hundred percent a characteristic of high capacity leaders. I just don't think you make it decades in unless you have that. And one of your growing areas, I'd love for you to tell us about your new book. So, uh, yeah. uh, writing a book is really easy, right? You know about oh, that. Oh my lord. <laughs> Listen, I have birthed three children, and I think that my my book was harder to birth than my three children. I'm so glad you said that. I've never birthed children. Yeah. I've fathered two, but I'm like, oh my gosh, this this last one's just eating my breakfast. Yeah, it it you know it's and you know and I'm not I'm trying not to sound super spiritual, but I will say this: if you look through Scripture, there was always a battle or always a warfare around the birthing of a miracle. And True. so I look at my book like this is a this we, this is what we said in the process while we were writing. This is either really supposed to be or it's really not supposed to be because there was a lot of you know the loss and just the battle of of are we doing this correctly and is it really answering the questions that people are asking and so um I was writing I had I had already signed the contract with with uh, my my publishers before my sister passed away. And I was excited. We, were, we had the title. We're going to call this book, Don't Miss the Moment. And it took me like, I just released it just a, a few months ago. It's not even out. Well, it's out as of March 17th. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm, it was like the hardest thing in the world to get to do, to get it out. I thought, I'm going to miss the moment while I am writing the book. <laughs> Missing Don't the moment. Miss the moment, you know? Any content creator has been there for sure. Oh my God. It's so I, I have a whole, this is my second book, but I have a whole brand new appreciation for authors. And I'm excited about the book because I feel like um, there's something in my personality, in my nature that uh, slows down everything, uh, you know, my husband is a complete opposite vision hits him. I'm like, uh, he's like, you know, we're, we're gung ho. We're ahead. We're running with it. I always have a tendency to kind of slow things down a bit. And, um, I, I, I think it, this book has been a, it, it's enabled me to tell people, especially to the general today's generation, um, that sometimes we can get so busy trying to, get to where we're going that we totally miss all of the little moments that it will take along the way to actually get there. Mm. Um, I I wrote it. I wrote the book because I wanted people to understand how powerful a moment is. It's um, small enough to miss, but it's big enough to change your life forever. Hmm. And I, I also feel like 
sometimes we can get so consumed with what's next that we miss what is. And True. those kind of moments that the, the moments of uh, that that are very important in life, we don't always get them back. Hmm. And so I wanted to just bring an awareness that you know, let's not be so busy. I realize the importance of vision and vision casting and and without a vision that we perish, whether it's in our business or whatever it is that we do with our lives. Um, but at the same time, don't miss what's now. We're so busy uh, looking for what's next that we miss what's now. And it's only as we are stewards over what's now that we can walk into what's next. What are when some, you're faithful over a few things. Oh, yeah. What are some habits or disciplines or practices that you've adopted, Cheryl, to help you slow down and see those moments because you're right uh things have just gotten busier with technology devices phones pace of life uh, it's harder than ever uh and and i'm a futurist so i live in the future on the, on the slowest of days so i have a hard time with the now what are some disciplines rhythms or practices that help you slow down and catch those moments because you got grandbabies now too so you I don't do. want to miss them that and you know what that's nine reasons right there i have nine uh, of them so that's nine reasons for me to slow down. Also, I have a daughter who has always been one of those people who says, whoa, let's, let's, let's enjoy the breeze. Let's enjoy mm. the walk. Let's, you know, um, but you know what? Sometimes life can, especially when you are a, a leader, so many doors can open for you Yeah. that, um, that if you're not careful, I think one of, you had, I think one of the questions I think that I read that we were going to talk about today and uh, was the question like if you could get any of your mistakes back, what oh, would yeah, you do? Oh yeah, let's go there. Our let's talk about back, that. What would you yeah, yeah. what would you do? And um I was thinking about that so much and I believe this is why I've, I've slowed down to the degree maybe that I have is because that I wished that I would have not always said yes just because there was an open door. Mm. So many things. Um, I went to one church and spoke. And from that one place, all of a sudden, I started getting these, these f phone calls and invitations to come to people's uh, churches and speak. And I was, I couldn't figure out how in the world, where nobody knows me in Iowa. Who's calling me in Iowa? They don't even know I exist. You know, just places that I had never been in my life. And so many things opened up. And I didn't know how they were opening up. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, I found out about a year or so later, after I had received, you know, several hundreds of invitations to speak, I found out that I had went and preached for somebody who had a show on BET. And they aired that whole show for a solid year, that, that sermon that I was at their church. For a year, and just you, year. over and over and over again on repeat. Over and over and over again. <laughs> and so the, pa awesome. and the reason I found that out was because the pastor flew in and he said, I just want to personally tell you that uh, we have done this. And I I was so shocked, uh, you know, I, when I, when I do mentorship classes, I always tell people, you know, I had a TV ministry and never knew it. <laughs> I had a TV ministry I didn't have to pay for. And, uh, so it was, that's where people were hearing. I literally did not know that that's where that was coming from. And so one door led to another door to another door. And the next thing I knew I was saying yes to a whole lot of doors because when you haven't necessarily had an open door mm -hmm. and God gives you one, you just think they're all God and <sighs> yes. you don't slow down and you don't discern the doors. And, and we, we really have to do that because what happened for me is I ended up so burnt out that, uh, still to this day, to this very day, I, I get triggers. You know what I'm saying? I get those I things do. that what, say, what triggers you? Uh, when I, like if, if invitations come in, if people say, we want you to do this, we want you to do that. Uh, I really take the time now to look at it. And the first thing I'm asking myself, God, 
do I have anything that's going to help where I'm going? Mm. Is there anything you've given me to say? Um, do, do I fit this this group? Is is it going to be a blessing to them and to me? Because sometimes I re- I will just tell you I ran just because the door was open. I ran into it, but every door is not a blessing. Mm. It exhausted me, and so still to this day I find myself, which ultimately it worked together for my good, but it took me through a whole lot of years of just being burnt out. I know what that feels like. And it started out a wonderful thing, but it ended up wiping me out. I really appreciate you sharing that. And there's a lot of leaders, I agree, that uh, leadership opens up all kinds of opportunities. And I feel like you're right in one of our meetings that we have almost every day with my team because there's so many requests, so many opportunities. We're just in one of those seasons and I realize it's not going to last forever, Uh, but there's more speaking opportunities and days on the calendar. There's more opportunities to do interviews like this where I flip the mic and I'm being interviewed. Then we have time available in the calendar. And so I find that for our team, we're always asking the question, of which doors do we walk through, to use your, your metaphor, and that the criteria that we use to make that decision keeps changing because yes. the offers keep changing, our life keeps changing, what we're doing keeps changing. What are some of the filters you have found really helpful to deciding what you say yes to and what you say no to? Um, uh, it, is it good versus God? You know, mm. and that this is spiritual, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. Spiritual for But what does that mean? Like to you, but, good but like, versus God. Is this God? just a good idea? Right. Because, right. you know, if it's if it's just a good idea, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a blessing to somebody. They're going to be a blessing to me. Um, but I found out that ultimately when I go, it takes, it takes of my strength. It takes, it always takes away from something. It takes it away from your home life. It takes away from your church or, or your business or your family. So, so in some of those things, it's easy for us to, to see it as an expense, but it really is an expense. Uh, and I learned that when my, toward the last years of my mother's life, because she had Alzheimer's. And Mm. when I would leave her, it would take me a day. I'd go a day early and I didn't do the event and come back the next day. So I was gone for two and a half, three days. And I would see a toll that it would take on her body and her mind because she didn't know where I was. Mm. And it, it cost me in my mother's um, health and in the way that 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 she learned to maneuver or we helped get her through the last moments of her life. And at, at, at that point, I just began to realize, well, this cost me. OK, yes, I'm I'm being a blessing. And yes, they're being a blessing. But at the end of the day, there are some costs that I haven't calculated. I didn't count up the whole cost. And uh, and I found myself and I still am to this day. I'm like there. I need to I need to count up the whole thing. Um, because if it takes me away from my church, if it takes me away from my team, um, there's those, those are costs that matter. And and so that I think, you know, maybe it's a good thing, but when it's a God thing, uh, for me, God always made up the difference. And I saw fruit. I saw fruit that remained not just instantaneous fruit, but fruit that had longevity. I would go and I would minister and I would come back and I would have something in me from where I went. So it was, wasn't just a one way thing for years. I'm going to be honest and say, I went and I went so fast that I just, I was just pouring my heart out. And I don't, I, my husband would call me at, at the end of a service. I'd be in the hotel room and he'd say, Hey babe, how was church? And I was like, I guess it was good. I think the people were blessed. Hmm. And every, every time I would say that I was a little more depleted and there is something that you can kick into that's just called robotics, you know, yes. and you're just doing it. And at that point, yeah, it's maybe a good thing for some people, but it's not necessarily a God thing. So I, I found myself feeling very empty. And so that's important to, to, de- to decide if this is good or if this is God. That's a really helpful filter. And I appreciate how you shared 
uh, you know, to calculate the personal cost, which I'm not very good at. And you're right. It does cost my marriage if I'm away sometimes yeah. or, and I'm not talking about, you know, we're heading to divorce court. I'm just oh, saying, right, right, no, right. You, these are hours you're not going to get back. And right. there's a time with your kids. You're not going to get back. This is sleep. You may not get back. And we do think robotically and we think that we are indestructible. And I learned the hard way 14 years ago that I'm not when I burned out. And it sounds like you've been through uh, tinges as well. And I think that's really important to to remember. That's super, yeah. super helpful. That Anything else you, yeah, you want to share on that? Yeah, like, we're, that we're not superheroes and that we, we're not Superman. We're not super women. Um, and I, th- I think if, there, if we're going to go, we really have to have that reason to go. And sometimes you, what, what's hard is when somebody invites you in uh, January and you say yes. And then here it comes. It's, it's the date's not till August. Then August rolls around and you're like, I don't feel the same as I felt when I said yes in January. <laughs> you know, I think, I think. Okay. You, you have know, been talking and, and, to my team. Uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> and so I think we really have to think it through, you know, mm-hmm. and don't be so quick to say yes, you know, uh, and, and I, I can just share this briefly with you and then we can move on. But I remember one time as I was really starting to come up in ministry, I remember I went, I was invited to speak somewhere and I walked in and I was prepared to speak. I took the stage and just some things happened and I never really got to minister that night like I wanted to. And I felt almost felt like the moment was, it might be hard for your audience to understand, but I felt like the moment was kind of stolen from me. Hmm. And I remember I go, going back to my hotel. How so? This was, How so? This was before all of the burnout. Okay. This uh-huh. was, this was, um, uh, it is, this is at the beginning stages and you know, you have a little bit of anxiousness and yeah. I, I was grateful for the opportunity. I was speaking to several thousands of women. Um, and so I was excited about it, but then, um, somebody, the person that was in charge of the conference ended up, um, taking the service and deciding that they felt like they needed to do something. Okay. Different. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. um, anyway, so I, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yes. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a great word for it. So I, um, I remember going back to my hotel feeling like, why did I prepare? Why am I here? If what was going on? And I, I felt like the door had been, uh, shut on me and, and I was just talking to God about it. And Carrie, I will never forget this. I was ironing my shirt Hmm. for the next day. I was standing over the ironing board. Tears were falling off my face. And I was saying, God, but that's not fair. You know, that's just not fair. And God said, Cheryl, he said it so clear to me. You know, there are just, there are moments that God has said things Mm -hmm. to me periodically that I'm like, that's God. I don't care what anybody believes. I, I just heard God. He said to me that day, I'm the man in your life. And I'm like, yes, yes, God, you're the man in my life. You're the man in my life. And he said, no, he says, you don't get it. I'm the man in your life and I will get every door for you. You don't have to put your hand on that door. Every door that you need to walk through, I will, like I'm the gentleman in your life. You know, you don't have to fight. You don't have to force. You don't have to flip out. Just just rest in me. And it was almost like I could see a grocery store back in. I don't know. I don't know if they even make grocery stores like this anymore. But when I was a kid, we used to walk up on this little mat Mm -hmm. that when you stepped on the mat, the door would fly open. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, it wasn't the camera. It was the mat. Yeah, I remember that. You know what it was? There was a sensor. Yes. And that sensor sensed that somebody was coming, somebody was there, and the door opened. And when I tell you that was like a revelation to me, that Cheryl, you don't have to force, you don't have to push, Mm. all you have to do is be ready. And when it is time for that door to open, I will open it. And that there, it's great, it's powerful, but therein is where my struggle lied. Uh, Because I was like, but just because they all open, doesn't mean I can walk through all of them. So I just had to be at the right time, at the right place. 
And there are practical things that you have to consider and uh, you know, t- before you say yes. And mm-hmm. one of those for me was count up the whole cost. That's so wise. You know, uh, I I love your idea of I'll open the door for you. Uh, It's funny, hundreds of hours of interviews a year, but something Kevin Queen said last year on an earlier episode, we'll link to it in the show notes, is pray a door open, don't pry a door open. And that's something that's been part of my, you know, last year or so. I've been like, okay. And it's so funny because sometimes you wait a little bit longer and sometimes the doors don't open the way you think they will. And then every once in a while, the gates swing wide. And oh, it's amazing that way. I that love that is, thought. That's amazing. I, I pray it or open, don't pry. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't want to be in a room that I have had to pry the door open. No. Because I, it makes me like, do I have what it takes? Because there's a lot of people who want that moment, uh, but you don't want to fail in that moment. And I, And I feel like that's the difference between maybe a good and a God. I think when, when God opens that door, you got the goods and, and you, you're going to have just what the audience needs to hear, uh, hear you say, you'll have it. At least that's how it's worked for me. This has been so good and so rich. So as we kind of wrap up, you've got a lot of young leaders listening. I would love for you to give them some advice. You're like, okay, speak to, 30 year old Cheryl and say, girl, here's what you need to know. All right. So what would you, what advice would you give to young leaders who are listening to say, Hey, keep your eye on this one. Yeah. You know, uh, it's been, it's been like a staple in my life and, um, I keep going back to scripture, but that's, that's my, that's me. That's my yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've always, I try to live by the motto and the scripture, um, that says, how important having clean hands and a pure heart is. Mm. Um, I, I feel like if I, and I say it almost everywhere I go, um, is that we just have to keep our agendas in check. Um, we have to keep our heart right because at the end of the day, God is all powerful. He has no problem opening any door to anybody. He can do it. You've seen him do it for your life. I've seen oh, him yeah. do it mine. Um, I mean, the, the the fact that I loved your podcast and now I'm on your podcast. <laughs> I mean, tell me God is not real. He's very real. Uh, but he, he has no problem opening a door. But what God does have a problem with is when we don't... Um, when, we, we, when, we, when we take that opportunity... Then we mishandle it. Yeah. And one thing that God was is not going to bless is when we don't do right by people, and mm. when we are not, um, when we get our agenda in the way of His agenda. Let me tell you something. Everything I go, everywhere I, everywhere I go, everything I do, even doing this today, none of this for me could have happened without God. Yeah. And I say it so many times because. I'm a high school dropout, Hmm. okay? And I don't say that proudly, but I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old. I was 15, actually, toward the end of my uh, 15th year. I dropped out of high school. And, you know, I look at my life today and I think, God, thank you so much for Hmm. having a plan for me that even when I tried to mess it up, you Still were faithful to me and you opened things for me and you made a way for me. You found a, a way to put me on Carrie's show hmm. or to know people like a Reggie or to know your circle of friends or to just put me in, in, in the life of a, a, a man called Bishop T.D. Jakes to give me a wonderful husband and family. I should have been a statistic. I should have been a statistic. Um, but I I feel so rich in so many ways um, because it really didn't have to happen for me like it did. But God was merciful and he was kind. And so I feel like that whenever he does extend me an opportunity, I can't make this about Cheryl. Mm-hmm. I can't make this about me. I mean, ultimately, I, I'm happy if anybody sees him in me, but... 
the truth of the matter is I didn't become the CEO of the Potter's House of North Dallas um, because I was so smart. No, I am where I am because he fine tooled me and, and, and fit me into this place. So I think I think it's important that we we keep our heart right, our hands clean, um, and that we do people right, and that we extend the love of Christ everywhere we go. And um, I, I, I think if we keep those things, in, and, and it's like I said in, in my book, Don't Miss the Moment, let's not be so um, what's next that we miss what's now. Because here's what happens. On your way up, on our way up, that's where we build in the system that holds us up oh, yeah. when we get there. And if we don't build that system and that structure, we bypass A, B, C, and D and just want to get up and hang out at E, you won't stay. You'll shoot up maybe, but you're going to come down just as quick. And it's in being faithful over every little moment hmm. that enables you to hang out there on top for just a little bit longer. Well, this has been so good for the mind and for the soul. And uh, tell us a little bit about where people can find you and the book online. You can find the book at uh, any, pretty much anywhere books are sold. And you can find it at CherylBrady.com slash moments. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just be so happy if everybody picked up a copy and just kind of went through that journey. And that Cheryl with an S, just so you know. Yeah, and of course, right. we'll have all the links in the show notes. And yeah. uh, this has been a joy. I've always enjoyed our time together. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. And thanks just for sharing in such a real way. Thank you, Carrie. It's been wonderful.